Candide. Semicolon, is a French satire first published in 1759 by Voltaire, a philosopher of the Age of Enlightenment. The novella has been widely translated, with English versions titled Candide, or, All for the Best, 1759, Candide, or, The Optimist, 1762, and Candide, Optimism, 1947. It begins with a young man, Candide, who is living a sheltered life in an Edenic paradise and being indoctrinated with Leibnizian optimism by his mentor, Professor Pancloss. The work describes the abrupt cessation of this lifestyle, followed by Candide's slow and painful disillusionment as he witnesses and experiences great hardships in the world. Voltaire concludes with Candide, if not rejecting Leibnizian optimism outright, advocating a deeply practical precept, we must cultivate our garden, in lieu of the Leibnizian mantra of Pangloss. All is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Candide is characterized by its tone as well as by its erratic, fantastical, and fast-moving plot. A picaresque novel with a story similar to that of a more serious coming-of-age narrative, Bill Dung's Roman, it parodies many adventure and romance clichés, the struggles of which are caricatured in a tone that is bitter on matter-of-fact. Still, the events discussed are often based on historical happenings, such as the Seven Years' War and the 1755 Lisbon earthquake. As philosophers of Voltaire's day contended with the problem of evil, so does Candide in this short novel, albeit more directly and humorously. Voltaire ridicules religion, theologians, governments, armies, philosophies, and philosophers. Through Candide, he assaults Leibniz and his optimism. Candide has enjoyed both great success and great scandal. Immediately after its secretive publication, the book was widely banned to the public because it contained religious blasphemy, political sedition, and intellectual hostility hidden under a thin veil of naivete. However, with its sharp wit and insightful portrayal of the human condition, the novel has since inspired many later authors and artists to mimic and adapt it. Today, Candide is recognized as Voltaire's magnum opus and is often listed as part of the Western canon. It is among the most frequently taught works of French literature. The British poet and literary critic Martin Seymour Smith listed Candide as one of the 100 most influential books ever written. A number of historical events inspired Voltaire to write Candide, most notably the publication of Leibniz's Monadology, a short metaphysical treatise, The Seven Years' War, and the 1755 Lisbon earthquake. Both of the latter catastrophes are frequently referred to in Candide and are cited by scholars as reasons for its composition. The 1755 Lisbon earthquake, tsunami, and resulting fires of All Saints' Day, had a strong influence on theologians of the day and on Voltaire, who was himself disillusioned by them. The earthquake had an especially large effect on the contemporary doctrine of optimism, a philosophical system which implies that such events should not occur. Optimism is founded on the theodicy of Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz and says all is for the best because God is a benevolent deity. This concept is often put into the form, all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Philosophers had trouble fitting the horrors of this earthquake into their optimistic worldview. Voltaire actively rejected Leibnizian optimism after the natural disaster, convinced that if this were the best possible world, it should surely be better than it is. In both Candide and, Poem on the Lisbon Disaster. Voltaire attacks this optimist belief. He makes use of the Lisbon earthquake in both Candide and his to argue this point, sarcastically describing the catastrophe as one of the most horrible disasters in the best of all possible worlds. Immediately after the earthquake, unreliable rumors circulated around Europe, sometimes overestimating the severity of the event. Ira Wade, a noted expert on Voltaire and Candide, has analyzed which sources Voltaire might have referenced in learning of the event. Wade speculates that Voltaire's primary source for information on the Lisbon earthquake was the 1755 work by Angie Gaudar. Apart from such events, contemporaneous stereotypes of the German personality may have been a source of inspiration for the text, as they were for, a 1669 satirical picaresque novel written by Hans Jacob Christoffel von Grimmelshausen and inspired by the Thirty Years' War. The protagonist of this novel, who was supposed to embody stereotypically German characteristics, is quite similar to the protagonist of Candide. These stereotypes, according to Voltaire biographer Alfred Owen Aldridge, include extreme credulousness or sentimental simplicity, two of Candide's and Simplicius's defining qualities. Aldridge writes, since Voltaire admitted familiarity with 15th-century German authors who used a bold and buffoonish style, it is quite possible that he knew as well.
a satirical and parodic precursor of Candide, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, 1726, is one of Candide's closest literary relatives. This satire tells the story of a gullible ingenue, Gulliver, who, like Candide, travels to several remote nations and is hardened by the many misfortunes which befall him. As evidenced by similarities between the two books, Voltaire probably drew upon Gulliver's travels for inspiration while writing Candide. Other probable sources of inspiration for Candide are, 1699, by François Fenelon and, 1753, by Louis-Charles Faugeret de Montbrun. Candide's parody of these is probably based on, which includes the prototypical parody of the tutor on whom Pangloss may have been partly based. Likewise, Montbrun's protagonist undergoes a disillusioning series of travels similar to those of Candide. Born Francois Marie Arway, Voltaire, 1694-1778, by the time of the Lisbon earthquake, was already a well-established author, known for his satirical wit. He had been made a member of the Académie Française in 1746. He was a deist a strong proponent of religious freedom, and a critic of tyrannical governments. Candide became part of his large, diverse body of philosophical, political and artistic works expressing these views. More specifically, it was a model for the 18th and early 19th century novels called the Conte Philosophiques. This genre, of which Voltaire was one of the founders, included previous works of his such as Sandique and Micromegas. It is unknown exactly when Voltaire wrote Candide but scholars estimate that it was primarily composed in late 1758 and begun as early as 1757. Voltaire is believed to have written a portion of it while living at Les Elys near Geneva and also while visiting Charles Theodore, the Elector Palatinate at Schwetzingen, for three weeks in the summer of 1758. Despite solid evidence for these claims, a popular legend persists that Voltaire wrote Candide in three days. This idea is probably based on a misreading of the 1885 work by Lucien Perry real name, Clara del Lucerpin, and Gaston Magris. The evidence indicates strongly that Voltaire did not rush or improvise Candide, but worked on it over a significant period of time, possibly even a whole year. Candide is mature and carefully developed, not impromptu, as the intentionally choppy plot in the aforementioned myth might suggest. There is only one extant manuscript of Candide that was written before the work's 1759 publication, it was discovered in 1956 by Wade and since named La Volière Manuscript. It is believed to have been sent, chapter by chapter, by Voltaire to the Duke and Duchess La Volière in the autumn of 1758. The manuscript was sold to the Bibliothèque de l'Arsenal in the late 18th century, where it remained undiscovered for almost 200 years. The La Volière Manuscript, the most original and authentic of all surviving copies of Candide, was probably dictated by Voltaire to his secretary, Jean Louis Wagner then edited directly. In addition to this manuscript, there is believed to have been another, one copied by Wagner for the elector Charles Theodore, who hosted Voltaire during the summer of 1758. The existence of this copy was first postulated by Norman L. Torrey in 1929. If it exists, it remains undiscovered. Voltaire published Candide simultaneously in five countries no later than January 15, 1759, although the exact date is uncertain. Seventeen versions of Candide from 1759, in the original French, are known today, and there has been great controversy over which is the earliest. More versions were published in other languages. Candide was translated once into Italian and thrice into English that same year. The complicated science of calculating the relative publication dates of all of the versions of Candide is described at length in Wade's article The First Edition of Candide, a problem of identification. The publication process was extremely secretive, probably the most clandestine work of the century, because of the book's obviously illicit and irreverent content. The greatest number of copies of Candide were published concurrently in Geneva by Kramer, in Amsterdam by Marc Michel Ray, in London by Jean Norse, and in Paris by Lambert. Candide underwent one major revision after its initial publication, in addition to some minor ones. In 1761, a version of Candide was published that included, along with several minor changes, a major addition by Voltaire to the 22nd chapter, a section that had been thought weak by the Duke of Voliere. The English title of this edition was Candide, or Optimism, translated from the German of Dr. Ralph. With the editions found in the doctor's pocket when died at Minden, in the year of Grace 1759.
The last edition of Candide authorized by Voltaire was the one included in Kramer's 1775 edition of his complete works, known as, in reference to the border of frame around each page. Voltaire strongly opposed the inclusion of illustrations in his works, as he stated in a 1778 letter to the writer and publisher Charles Joseph Pankhank. Despite this protest, two sets of illustrations for Candide were produced by the French artist Jean-Michel Moreau The first version was done, at Moreau's own expense, in 1787 and included in Cale's publication of that year, Oeuvres Complète de Voltaire. Four images were drawn by Moreau for this edition and were engraved by Pierre-Charles Bacoy. The second version, in 1803, consisted of seven drawings by Moreau which were transposed by multiple engravers. The 20th century modern artist Paul Clay stated that it was while reading Candide that he discovered his own artistic style. Clay illustrated the work, and his drawings were published in a 1920 version edited by Kurt Wolf. Candide contains 30 episodic chapters, which may be grouped into two main schemes, one consists of two divisions, separated by the protagonist's hiatus in El Dorado, the other consists of three parts, each defined by its geographical setting. By the former scheme, the first half of Candide constitutes the Riz's action and the last part the resolution. This view is supported by the strong theme of travel and quest, reminiscent of adventure and picaresque novels, which tend to employ such a dramatic structure. By the latter scheme, the 30 chapters may be grouped into three parts each comprising 10 chapters and defined by locale, IX are set in Europe, 11-20 are set in the Americas and 21-30 are set in Europe and the Ottoman Empire. The plot summary that follows uses this second format and includes Voltaire's editions of 1761. The tale of Candide begins in the castle of the Baron Thundertentronk in Westphalia, home to, the Baron's daughter, Lady Cunegond, his bastard nephew, Candide, a tutor, Pangloss, a chambermaid, Pocket, and the rest of the Baron's family. The protagonist, Candide, is romantically attracted to Cunegond. He is a young man of the most unaffected simplicity, whose face is the true index of his mind. Dr. Pangloss, professor of English, metaphysico theologo cosmologology, and self proclaimed optimist, teaches his pupils that they live in the best of all possible worlds and that all is for the best. All is well in the castle until Cunegond sees Pangloss sexually engaged with Paquette in some bushes. Encouraged by this show of affection, Cunegon drops her handkerchief next to Candide, enticing him to kiss her. For this infraction, Candide is evicted from the castle, at which point he is captured by Bulgar, Prussian, recruiters and coerced into military service, where he is flogged, nearly executed, and forced to participate in a major battle between the Bulgars and the Avars, an allegory representing the Prussians and the French. Candide eventually escapes the army and makes his way to Holland where he is given aid by Jacques, an Anabaptist, who strengthens Candide's optimism. Soon after, Candide finds his master Pangloss, now a beggar with syphilis. Pangloss reveals he was infected with this disease by Paquette and shocks Candide by relating how Castle Thunder Tentronk was destroyed by Bulgars, that Cunegonde and her whole family were killed, and that Cunegonde was raped before her death. Pangloss is cured of his illness by Jacques, losing one eye and one ear in the process, and the three set sail to Lisbon. In Lisbon's harbor, they are overtaken by a vicious storm which destroys the boat. Jacques attempts to save a sailor, and in the process is thrown overboard. The sailor makes no move to help the drowning Jacques, and Candide is in a state of despair until Pangloss explains to him that Lisbon Harbor was created in order for Jacques to drown. Only Pangloss, Candide, and the brutish sailor who let Jacques drown survive the wreck and reach Lisbon, which is promptly hit by an earthquake, tsunami, and fire that kill tens of thousands. The sailor leaves in order to loot the rubble while Candide, injured and begging for help, is lectured on the optimistic view of the situation by Pangloss. The next day, Pangloss discusses his optimistic philosophy with a member of the Portuguese Inquisition, and he and Candide are arrested for heresy, set to be tortured and killed in and set up to appease God and prevent another disaster. Candide is flogged and sees Pangloss hanged, but another earthquake intervenes and he escapes. He is approached by an old woman who leads him to a house where Lady Cunegonde waits, alive. Candide is surprised, Pangloss had told him that Cunegonde had been raped and disemboweled. She had been, but Cunegonde points out that people survive such things. However, her rescuer sold her to a Jewish merchant, Don Issachar, who was then threatened by a corrupt Grand Inquisitor into sharing her. Don Issachar gets Cunegonde on Mondays, Wednesdays, and the Sabbath day. 
Her owners arrive, find her with another man, and Condit kills them both. Condit and the two women flee the city, heading to the Americas. Along the way, Cunegonde falls into self pity, complaining of all the misfortunes that have befallen her. The old woman reciprocates by revealing her own tragic life. Born the daughter of Pope Urban X and the Princess of Palestrina, she was raped and enslaved by African pirates, witnessed violent civil wars in Morocco under the bloodthirsty King Molay Ismail, during which her mother was drawn and quartered, suffered further slavery and famine, nearly died from a plague in Algiers, and had a buttock cut off to feed starving Janissaries during the Russian siege of Azov. After traversing all the Russian Empire, she eventually became a servant of Don Issachar and met Cunegon. The tree arrives in Buenos Aires, where Governor Don Fernando de Baraway Figueroa y Mascarines de Lampertos y Sousa asks to marry Cunegon. Just then, an alcalde, a Spanish fortress commander, arrives, pursuing Condide for killing the Grand Inquisitor. Leaving the women behind, Condide flees to Paraguay with his practical and heretofore unmentioned manservant, Cacambo. At a border post on the way to Paraguay, Cacambo and Condide speak to the commandant who turns out to be Cunegon's unnamed brother. He explains that after his family was slaughtered, the Jesuits' preparation for his burial revived him, and he has since joined the order. When Condide proclaims he intends to marry Cunegon, her brother attacks him, and Condide runs him through with his rapier. After lamenting all the people, mainly priests, he has killed, he and Cacambo flee. In their flight, Condide and Cacambo come across two naked women being chased and bitten by a pair of monkeys. Condide, Seeking to protect the women, shoots and kills the monkeys, but is informed by Cacambo that the monkeys and women were probably lovers. Cacambo and Condide are captured by Or Islands, or Or Jones, members of the Inca nobility who widen the lobes of their ears, and are depicted here as deaf fictional inhabitants of the area. Mistaking Condide for a Jesuit by his robes, the Or Islands prepare to cook Condide and Cacambo, however, Cacambo convinces the Or Islands that Condide killed the Jesuit to procure the robe. Cacambo and Condide are released and travel for a month on foot and then down a river by canoe, living on fruits and berries. After a few more adventures, Condide and Cacambo wander into El Dorado, a geographically isolated utopia where the streets are covered with precious stones, there exist no priests, and all of the king's jokes are funny. Condide and Cacambo stay a month in El Dorado, but Condide is still in pain without Cunegond, and expresses to the king his wish to leave. The king points out that this is a foolish idea, but generously helps them do so. The pair continue their journey, now accompanied by 100 red pack sheep carrying provisions and incredible sums of money, which they slowly lose or have stolen over the next few adventures. Candide and Cacambo eventually reach Suriname, where they split up. Cacambo travels to Buenos Aires to retrieve Lady Cunegonde, while Candide prepares to travel to Europe to await the two. Candide's remaining sheep are stolen and Condit is fined heavily by a Dutch magistrate for petulance over the theft. Before leaving Suriname, Condit feels in need of companionship, so he interviews a number of local men who have been through various ill fortunes and settles in a man named Martin. This companion, Martin, is a Manichaean scholar based on the real-life pessimist Pierre Bale, who was a chief opponent of Leibniz. For the remainder of the voyage, Martin and Condit argue about philosophy, Martin painting the entire world is occupied by fools. Condide, however, remains an optimist at heart, since it is all he knows. After a detour to Bordeaux and Paris, they arrive in England and see an admiral, based in Admiral Bing, being shot for not killing enough of the enemy. Martin explains that Britain finds it necessary to shoot an admiral from time to time pour encouragement de autre, to encourage the others. Condide, horrified, arranges for them to leave Britain immediately. Upon their arrival in Venice, Condide and Martin meet Paquette, the chambermaid who infected Pangloss with his syphilis, in Venice. She is now a prostitute, and is spending her time with a theatine monk, Brother Giroflay. Although both appear happy on the surface, they reveal their despair. Paquette has led a miserable existence as a sexual object, and the monk detests the religious order in which he was indoctrinated. Condide gives 2,000 piastres to Paquette and 1,000 to Brother Giroflay. Condide and Martin visit the Lord Poco Curant, a noble Venetian. That evening, Cacambo, now a slave, arrives and informs Condide that Cunegonde is in Constantinople. Prior to their departure, Condide and Martin dine with six strangers who had come for Carnival of Venice. These strangers are revealed to be dethroned kings the Ottoman Sultan Ahmed III, Emperor Ivan VI of Russia, Charles Edward Stuart, 
an unsuccessful pretender to the English throne, Augustus III of Poland, Stanislaw Ashinsky, and Theodore of Corsica. On the way to Constantinople, Kakambo reveals that Kune Gond, now horribly ugly, currently washes dishes on the banks of the Propontis as a slave for a Transylvanian prince by the name of Rakochi. After arriving at the Bosphorus, they board a galley where, to Candide's surprise, he finds Pangloss and Cunegan's brother among the rowers. Candide buys their freedom and further passage at steep prices. The Baron and Pangloss relate how they survived, but despite the horrors he has been through, Pangloss's optimism remains unshaken, I still hold to my original opinions, because, after all, I'm a philosopher, and it wouldn't be proper for me to recant, since Leibniz cannot be wrong, and since pre-established harmony is the most beautiful thing in the world, along with the plenum and subtle matter. Candide, the Baron, Pangloss, Martin, and Cacambo arrive at the banks of the Propontis, where they rejoin Cunegonde and the old woman. Cunegonde has indeed become hideously ugly, but Candide nevertheless buys their freedom and marries Cunegonde despite her brother, who forbids Cunegonde from marrying anyone but a baron of the empire, he is secretly sold back into slavery. Paquette and brother Giroflay, having squandered their 3,000 piastres, are reconciled with Candide on a small farm, which he just bought with the last of his finances. One day, the protagonists seek out a dervish known as a great philosopher of the land. Candide asks him why man is made to suffer so, and what they ought to do. The dervish responds by asking rhetorically why Candide is concerned about the existence of evil and good. The dervish describes human beings as Mikey on a ship sent by a king to Egypt, their comfort does not matter to the king. The dervish then slams his door on the group. Returning to their farm, Candide, Pangloss, and Martin meet a Turk whose philosophy is to devote his life only to simple work and not concern himself with external affairs. He and his four children cultivate a small area of land, and the work keeps them free of three great evils, boredom, vice, and poverty. Candide, Pangloss, Martin, Cunegonde, Pocket, Cacambo, the old woman, and Brother Giroflay all set to work on this commendable plan, on their farm, each exercising his or her own talents. Candide ignores Pangloss's insistence that all turned out for the best by necessity, instead telling him we must cultivate our garden. As Voltaire himself described it, the purpose of Candide was to bring amusement to a small number of men of wit. The author achieves this goal by combining his sharp wit with a fun parody of the classic adventure romance plot. Candide is confronted with horrible events described in painstaking detail so often that it becomes humorous. Literary theorist Francis K. Barish described Voltaire's matter-of-fact narrative as treating topics such as mass death as coolly as a weather report. The fast-paced and improbable plot, in which characters narrowly escape death repeatedly, for instance, allows for compounding tragedies to befall the same characters over and over again. In the end, Candide is primarily, as described by Voltaire's biographer Ian Davidson, short, light, rapid and humorous. Behind the playful facade of Candide which has amused so many, there lies very harsh criticism of contemporary European civilization which angered many others. European governments such as France, Prussia, Portugal and England are each attacked ruthlessly by the author, the French and Prussians for the Seven Years' War, the Portuguese for their Inquisition, and the British for the execution of John Beng. Organized religion, too, is harshly treated in Candide. For example, Voltaire mocks the Jesuit order of the Roman Catholic Church. Aldridge provides a characteristic example of such anti-clerical passages for which work was banned, while in Paraguay, Cacampo remarks, the Jesuits, are masters of everything, and the people have no money at all. Here, Voltaire suggests the Christian mission in Paraguay is taking advantage of the local population. Voltaire depicts the Jesuits holding the indigenous peoples as slaves while they claim to be helping them. The main method of Candide's satire is to contrast ironically great tragedy and comedy. This story does not invent or exaggerate evils of the world, it displays real ones starkly, allowing Voltaire to simplify subtle philosophies and cultural traditions, highlighting their flaws. Thus Candide derides optimism, for instance, with a deluge of horrible, historical, or at least plausible, events with no apparent redeeming qualities. A simple example of the satire of Candide is seen in the treatment of the historic event witnessed by Candide and Martin in Portsmouth Harbor. There, the duo spy an anonymous admiral, supposed to represent John Bing, being executed for failing to properly engage a French fleet. The admiral is blindfolded and shot on the deck of his own ship, merely to encourage the others. 
This depiction of military punishment trivializes Bing's death. The dry, pithy explanation to encourage the others thus satirizes a serious historical event in characteristically Voltairean fashion. For its classic wit, this phrase has become one of the more often quoted from Condé. Voltaire depicts the worst of the world in his pathetic hero's desperate effort to fit it into an optimistic outlook. Almost all of Condé is a discussion of various forms of evil, its characters rarely find even temporary respite. There is at least one notable exception, the episode of El Dorado, a fantastic village in which the inhabitants are simply rational, and their society is just unreasonable. The positivity of El Dorado may be contrasted with the pessimistic attitude of most of the book. Even in this case, the bliss of El Dorado is fleeting, Candide soon leaves the village to seek Cune Gond, whom he eventually marries only out of a sense of obligation. Another element of the satire focuses on what William F. Botilia, author of many published works on Candide, calls the sentimental foibles of the age and Voltaire's attack on them. Flaws in European culture are highlighted as Candide parodies adventure and romance cliches, mimicking the style of a picaresque novel. A number of archetypal characters thus have recognizable manifestations in Voltaire's work, Candide is supposed to be the drifting rogue of low social class, Cunegonde the sex interest, Pangloss the knowledgeable mentor and Cacambo the skillful valet. As the plot unfolds, readers find that Candide is no rogue, Cunegonde becomes ugly and Pangloss is a stubborn fool. The characters of Candide are unrealistic, two-dimensional, mechanical, and even marionette-like, they are simplistic and stereotypical. As the initially naive protagonist eventually comes to a mature conclusion, however non-committal, the novella is a Bildungsroman, if not a very serious one. Gardens are thought by many critics to play a critical symbolic role in Candide. The first location commonly identified as a garden is the Castle of the Baron, from which Candide and Cunegonde are evicted much in the same fashion as Adam and Eve are evicted from the Garden of Eden in the Book of Genesis. Cyclically. The main characters of Candide conclude the novel in a garden of their own making, one which might represent celestial paradise. The third most prominent garden is El Dorado, which may be a false Eden. Other possibly symbolic gardens include the Jesuit Pavilion, the Garden of Poco Curant, Cacambo's Garden, and the Turk's Garden. These gardens are probably references to the Garden of Eden, but it has also been proposed, by Botilia, for example, that the gardens refer also to the Encyclopedia and that Candide's conclusion to cultivate his garden symbolizes Voltaire's great support for this endeavor. Candide and his companions, as they find themselves at the end of the novella, are in a very similar position to Voltaire's tightly knit philosophical circle which supported the, the main characters of Candide live in seclusion to cultivate, their, garden, just as Voltaire suggested his colleagues leave society to write. In addition, there is evidence in the epistolary correspondence of Voltaire that he had elsewhere used the metaphor of gardening to describe writing the. Another interpretative possibility is that Candide cultivating his garden suggests his engaging in only necessary occupations, such as feeding oneself and fighting boredom. This is analogous to Voltaire's own view on gardening, he was himself a gardener at his estates in Les Delis and Ferny, and he often wrote in his correspondence that gardening was an important pastime of his own it being an extraordinarily effective way to keep busy. Candide satirizes various philosophical and religious theories that Voltaire had previously criticized. Primary among these is Leibnizian optimism, sometimes called Panglossianism after its fictional proponent, which Voltaire ridicules with descriptions of seemingly endless calamity. Voltaire demonstrates a variety of irredeemable evils in the world, leading many critics to contend that Voltaire's treatment of evil specifically the theological problem of its existence, is the focus of the work. Heavily referenced in the text are the Lisbon earthquake, disease, and the sinking of ships and storms. Also, war, thievery, and murder, evils of human design, are explored as extensively in Candida's are environmental ills. Botilia notes Voltaire is comprehensive in his enumeration of the world's evils. He is unrelenting in attacking Leibnizian optimism. Fundamental to Voltaire's attack is Candide's tutor Pangloss a self-proclaimed follower of Leibniz and a teacher of his doctrine. Ridicule of Pangloss's theories thus ridicules Leibniz himself, and Pangloss's reasoning is silly at best. For example, Pangloss's first teachings of the narrative absurdly mix up cause and effect. Following such flawed reasoning even more doggedly than Candide, Pangloss defends optimism. Whatever their horrendous fortune, Pangloss reiterates Alice for the best, and proceeds to justify the evil event's occurrence. 
A characteristic example of such theodicy is found in Pangloss's explanation of why it is good that syphilis exists. Candide, the impressionable and incompetent student of Pangloss, often tries to justify evil, fails, invokes his mentor and eventually despairs. It is by these failures that Candide is painfully cured, as Voltaire would see it, of his optimism. This critique of Voltaire seems to be directed almost exclusively at Leibnizian optimism. Candide does not ridicule Voltaire's contemporary Alexander Pope, a later optimist of slightly different convictions. Candide does not discuss Pope's optimistic principle that all is right, but Leibniz's that states, this is the best of all possible worlds. However subtle the difference between the two, Candide is unambiguous as to which is its subject. Some critics conjecture that Voltaire meant to spare Pope this ridicule out of respect, although Voltaire's poem may have been written as a more direct response to Pope's theories. This work is similar to Candide in subject matter, but very different from it in style. The poem embodies a more serious philosophical argument than Candide. The conclusion of the novel, in which Candide finally dismisses his tutor's optimism, leaves unresolved what philosophy the protagonist is to accept in its stead. This element of Candide has been written about voluminously, perhaps above all others. The conclusion is enigmatic and its analysis is contentious. Voltaire develops no formal systematic philosophy for the characters to adopt. The conclusion of the novel may be thought of not as a philosophical alternative to optimism, but as a prescribed practical outlook, though it prescribes as in dispute. Many critics have concluded that one minor character or another is portrayed as having the right philosophy. For instance, a number believe that Martin is treated sympathetically, and that his character holds Voltaire's ideal philosophy, pessimism. Others disagree. Citing Voltaire's negative descriptions of Martin's principles and the conclusion of the work in which Martin plays little part. Within debates attempting to decipher the conclusion of Candide lies another primary Candide debate. This one concerns the degree to which Voltaire was advocating a pessimistic philosophy, by which Candide and his companions give up hope for a better world. Critics argue that the group's reclusion one farm signifies Candide and his companions' loss of hope for the rest of the human race. This view is to be compared to a reading that presents Voltaire advocating a melioristic philosophy and a precept committing the travelers to improving the world through metaphorical gardening. This debate, and others, focuses on the question of whether or not Voltaire was prescribing passive retreat from society, or active industrious contribution to it. Separate from the debate about the text's conclusion is the inside slash outside controversy. This argument centers on the matter of whether or not Voltaire was actually prescribing anything. Roy Wolper, Professor Emeritus of English, argues in a revolutionary 1969 paper that Condé does not necessarily speak for its author, that the work should be viewed as a narrative independent of Voltaire's history, and that its message is entirely, or mostly, it. This point of view, the inside, specifically rejects attempts to find Voltaire's voice in the many characters of Condé and his other works. Indeed, writers have seen Voltaire as speaking through at least Condé, Martin, and the Turk. Wolper argues that Candide should be read with a minimum of speculation as to its meaning in Voltaire's personal life. His article ushered in a new era of Voltaire studies, causing many scholars to look at the novel differently. Critics such as Lester Crocker, Henry Stevan, and Vivian Milne find too many similarities between Candide's point of view and that of Voltaire to accept inside view, they support the outside interpretation. They believe that Candide's final decision is the same as Voltaire's, and see a strong connection between the development of the protagonist and his author. Some scholars who support the outside view also believe that the isolationist philosophy of Old Turk closely mirrors that of Voltaire. Others see a strong parallel between Candide's gardening at the conclusion and the gardening of the author. Martin Darmenmeyer argues that the inside view fails to see the satirical work in context, and that denying that Candide is primarily a mockery of optimism a matter of historical context, is a very basic betrayal of the text. Though Voltaire did not openly admit to having written the controversial Candide until 1768, until then he signed with a pseudonym, Monsieur Le Docteur Ralph, or Dr. Ralph, his authorship of the work was hardly disputed. Immediately after publication, the work and its author were denounced by both secular and religious authorities, because the book openly derides government and church alike. It was because of such polemics that Omer Louis Francois Jolie de Fleury, who was advocate general to the Parisian parliament when Candide was published, found parts of Candide to be contrary to religion and morals. Despite much official indictment, soon after its publication, Candide's irreverent prose was being quoted. 
Let us see the Jesuit, for instance, became the popular phrase for its reference to a humorous passage in Candide. By the end of February 1759, the Grand Council of Geneva and the Administrators of Paris had banned Candide. Candide nevertheless succeeded in selling 20,000 to 30,000 copies by the end of the year in over 20 editions, making it a bestseller. The Duc de la Valliere speculated near the end of January 1759 that Candide might have been the fastest selling book ever. In 1762, Candide was listed in the Index Liberum Prohibitorum, the Roman Catholic Church's list of prohibited books. Bannings of Candide lasted into the 20th century in the United States, where it has long been considered a seminal work of Western literature. At least once, Candide was temporarily barred from entering America. In February 1929, a U.S. customs official in Boston prevented a number of copies off book, deemed obscene, from reaching a Harvard University French class. Candide was admitted in August of the same year, however, by that time class was over. In an interview soon after Candide's detention, the official who confiscated the book explained the office's decision to ban it, but about Candide, I'll tell you. For years we've been letting that book get by. There were so many different editions, all sizes and kinds, some illustrated and some plain, that we figured the book must be all right. Then one of us happened to read it. It's a filthy book. Candide is the most widely read of Voltaire's many works, and it is considered one of the great achievements of Western literature. However, Candide is not necessarily considered a true classic. According to Botilia, the physical size of Candide, as well as Voltaire's attitude toward his fiction, precludes the achievement of artistic dimension through plenitude, autonomous 3D vitality, emotional resonance, or poetic exaltation. Candide, then, cannot in quantity or quality, measure up to the supreme classics. Botilia instead calls it a miniature classic, though others are more forgiving off its size. As the only work of Voltaire which has remained popular up to the present day, Candide is listed in Harold Bloom's. It is included in the Encyclopedia Britannica collection Great Books of the Western World. Candide has influenced modern writers of black humor such as Céline, Joseph Heller, John Barth, Thomas Pynchon, Kurt Vonnegut, and Terry Southern. Its parody and picaresque methods have become favorites of black humorists. Charles Brockton Brown, an early American novelist may have been directly affected by Voltaire, whose work he knew well. Mark Camerath, professor of English, describes the strength of the connection between Candide and Edgar Huntley, or, Memoirs of a Sleepwalker, 1799, an unusually large number of parallels, crop up in the two novels, particularly in terms of characters and plot. For instance, the protagonists of both novels are romantically involved with a recently orphaned young woman. Furthermore, in both works the brothers of the female lovers are Jesuits, and each is murdered, although under different circumstances. Some 20th century novels that may have been influenced by Candide are dystopian science fiction works. Armand Madelert, a French critic, sees Candide in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, George Orwell's 1984 and Yevgeny Semyon's We, three canonical works of the genre. Specifically, Madelert writes that in each of these works, there exist references to Candide's popularization of the phrase the best of all possible worlds. He cites as evidence, for example, that the French version of Brave New World was entitled. Readers of Candide often compare it with certain works of the modern genre the theater of the absurd. Haydn Mason, a Voltaire scholar, sees in Candide a few similarities to this brand of literature. For instance, he notes commonalities of Candide in Waiting for Godot, 1952. In both of these works, and in a similar manner, friendship provides emotional support for characters when they are confronted with harshness of their existence. Is not, however, Mason qualifies, the must not be seen as a forerunner of the absurd in modern fiction. Candide's world has many ridiculous and meaningless elements, but human beings are not totally deprived of the ability to make sense out of it. John Pilling, biographer of Beckett, does state that Candide was an early and powerful influence on Beckett's thinking. Rosa Luxemburg, in the aftermath of the First World War, remarked upon rereading Candide, Before the war, I would have thought this wicked compilation of all human misery a caricature. Now it strikes me as altogether realistic. The American alternative rock band Bloodhound Gang referred to Candide in their song Take the Long Way Home, from the American edition of their 1999 album Hooray for Boobies. In 1760, one year after Voltaire published Candide, a sequel was published with the name. This work is attributed both to Torel de Campy a writer unknown today, and Henri Joseph de Lawrence, 
who is suspected of having habitually plagiarized Voltaire. The story continues in this sequel with Candida having new adventures in the Ottoman Empire, Persia, and Denmark. Part 2 has potential use in studies of the popular and literary receptions of Candide, but is almost certainly apocryphal. In total, by the year 1803, at least ten imitations of Candide or continuations of its story were published by authors other than Voltaire. The operetta Candide was originally conceived by playwright Lillian Hellman, as a play with incidental music. Leonard Bernstein, the American composer and conductor who wrote the music, was so excited about the project that he convinced Hellman to do it as a comic operetta. Many lyricists worked on the show, including James Agee, Dorothy Parker, John Latouche, Richard Wilbur, Leonard, and Felicia Bernstein, Stephen Sondheim and Hellman. Hershey K. orchestrated all the pieces except for the overture, which Bernstein did himself. Candide first opened on Broadway as a musical on December 1, 1956. The premiere production was directed by Tyrone Guthrie and conducted by Samuel Grick Malnick. While this production was a box office flop, the music was highly praised, and an original cast album was made. The album gradually became a cult hit, but Hellman's libretto was criticized as being too serious an adaptation of Voltaire's novel. Candide would be more popular 17 years later with a new libretto by Hugh Wheeler. 1977, or simply as a book by Leonardo Shostcha. It was at least partly based on Voltaire's Candide, although the actual influence of Candide on is a hotly debated topic. A number of theories on the matter have been proposed. Proponents of one say that is very similar to Candide, only with a happy ending. Supporters of another claim that Voltaire provided Shostcha with only a starting point from which to work, that the two books are quite distinct. The BBC produced a television adaptation in 1973, with Ian Ogilvy as Candide, Emrys James as Dr. Pangloss, and Frank Finley as Voltaire himself, acting as the narrator. Nedim Gersel wrote his 2001 novel A Voyage to Candide to Istanbul about a minor passage in Candide during which its protagonist meets Ahmed III, the deposed Turkish sultan. This chance meeting on a ship from Venice to Istanbul is the setting of Gersel's book. Terry Southern, in writing his popular novel Candy with Mason Hoffenberg adapted Candide for a modern audience and changed the protagonist from male to female. Candy deals with the rejection of a sort of optimism which the author sees in women's magazines of the modern era. Candy also parodies pornography and popular psychology. This adaptation of Candide was itself adapted for the cinema by director Christian Marquand in 1968. In addition to the above, Candide was made into a number of minor films and theatrical adaptations throughout the 20th century. For a list of these, see, 1989, with preface and commentaries by Pierre Malandon. In May 2009, a play called Optimism, based on Candide, opened at the Cub Malt House Theatre in Melbourne. It followed the basic storyline of Candide incorporating anachronisms, music and stand-up comedy from comedian Frank Woodley. It toured Australia and played at the Edinburgh International Festival. In 2010, the Icelandic writer Otar M. Northfjord published a rewriting and modernization of Candide, entitled Plain Text and HTML. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.